Hello and welcome everyone. Tonight's program is the second of our four part program series about the Ottawa urban wildlife. We'll be exploring topics such as Ottawa bird species, biodiversity of our wildlife, Ottawa species at risk, and how to appreciate the various urban wildlife safely for both humans and animals. Tonight's presenter, Amy, is an environmental biologist working in the Natural Systems and Rural Affairs Unit at the City of Ottawa. In addition to working on sub uh, watershed studies, environmental assessments, and other planning initiatives, Amy organizes the City's Wildlife um, Speaker Series events. She also develops and maintains lists of several types of wildlife found in the city, including lists of species at risk in Ottawa. Other recent projects include the development of bird safe design guidelines and the City Hall Pollinator Garden. Prior to joining the city in 2006, Amy worked for first seven years on a, as an environmental consultant. In her spare time, Amy enjoys nature photography and lately has put in this hobby to good use by contributing to uh, observations to iNaturalist. Amy, over to you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for sharing your evening with us. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. And there we go. And hopefully we've got the right view on. If the, my friends at uh, OPL can just confirm that for us. That'd be great. Okay. Well, not hearing any protests. We'll assume that I've got the right view. We may have to switch it up, Amy. We oh dear. Notes. We've got the notes up. Okay, so display settings. Let's try that. How are we doing now? Nope. <laughs> See, we try these things and then it just, you know, doesn't work the way we think it will. Okay, so I'm swapping it back. And I'm going to stop sharing and we'll try it again. Okay. Let's try it this way. Sorry about that, Christine. Can you just confirm for me? Is that working properly now? You're good to go. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, as I said, good evening, everyone. Today is National Indigenous Peoples Day in what is also the National Indigenous History Month. And so I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. We are streaming to you live today from the city of Ottawa which is built on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation. We would like to honor the peoples and land of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation, Miigwech. We would also like to honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, their elders, their ancestors, and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. And that of course includes the biodiversity of all of the plants and wildlife in it. We encourage all those listening, wherever you might be, to do the same. Thank you. So tonight we're talking about biodiversity. And what do we mean by biodiversity? Technically, it's the diversity of all forms of life. Usually we focus on wildlife, not domestic animals, agricultural crops, house plants, that sort of thing. We usually differentiate between native versus introduced species. And as an environmental biologist uh, and a naturalist, I focus mostly on the native biodiversity when I can. We don't usually count ourselves as a species. However, it's important to remember that humans, our domestic animals, and the introduced species all definitely affect biodiversity. We are all part of the system that we inhabit. And what we do and, and all of the species that we bring with us have definite effects. So looking at the city itself, 
Ottawa is a biodiverse city, and you could make a little bit of a pun out of that, I suppose, biodiversity, here we are. The city is almost 2,800 square kilometers in size. It's immense, and it contains a wide range of habitat types, including woodlands, wetlands, grasslands, agricultural fields, many types of suburban and urban habitats, um, of all sorts. There's an entire range from, you know, downtown core with a lot of concrete and mown grass and manicured gardens, all the way out to the vast rural natural areas out in the Carp Hills, Marlborough Forest, and Marbleu. Um, we have thousands of hectares of natural habitat and we have thousands of species of plants and animals found in those natural areas. We are truly quite blessed with the diversity and scale of our city and its habitats and life. You can see the picture here on this slide shows a familiar view for some, I'm sure, from the ridge at Mud Lake and uh, the Britannia Woods. So, I mean, that one picture encapsulates a number of the different types of habitats that you will see in Ottawa. You can't really talk about wildlife without including the plant life. All animal species depend directly or indirectly on plants. And it's especially true when you talk about native species um, in an area the native wildlife and the native plants have evolved together over thousands of years, and they're often quite interconnected ecologically. So when I say we have over 1,000 species of native plants in this area, uh, we're only talking about the vascular plants, as we call them. So the trees, flowers, grasses, not including all of the different types of mosses, lichens, and algae. We'll get to those a little later. We have over 1,500 species of plants recorded in our official plant list for the city of Ottawa, but approximately one third of those are introduced, whether deliberately or accidentally, sometimes both. Um, so here on the slide, I've just included a collection of photos of some of our more colorful native plant species. All of the photos in the slideshow, by the way, are, are my own, um, taken mostly here in Ottawa. They're all of species that can be found in Ottawa. And, um, you know, the, there's such an incredible diversity of beautiful, beautiful species. So, you know, just um, keep your eyes open when you're out there. It's, it's amazing what you can see sometimes. And we're certainly into some of the better months of the year for seeing just some gorgeous wildflowers and, uh, and some, you know, beautiful forests. So going on in many of those forests and natural areas, you will find some of the over 180 species of breeding birds that we have here in Ottawa. And again, you know, all of these species are certainly found within the city limits. Some of them are quite easy to spot. If you go along the Ottawa River uh, at Andrew Hayden Park, you'll usually see one or two great egrets, the big white wading birds, walking along in the cattails near the shore. Or if you go to Mud Lake, you might see the ospreys hanging around and fishing. Or of course, the wood ducks. Lots of people take photos of those when they're there. There's a new breeding bird atlas effort currently underway. Some of you may be involved in as volunteers. People will be surveying for breeding birds in the Ottawa area over the next five years to help update the breeding list um, of species. So the current city's list of breeding birds will be updated in accordance with the findings of the Ontario breeding bird atlas for our region. So here we have, again, some of the more colorful species, the, um, the black and orange Baltimore or Northern Oriole is always a favorite of mine. Got some of my favorite colors on it. Um, and of course, lots of folks will probably be familiar with the red-winged blackbird in the lower right corner. 
especially if you've accidentally gotten too close to its nest when it's uh, guarding that. You may have gotten dive bombed along the Rideau Canal or near some of our other wetland areas. Just trying to protect his offspring, like a good dad. But we also have more birds that come by at different times of the year. The breeding birds are the ones that come here to nest or may live here year round and, and have their nests here. But we also have more species that come by during the winter. And this, this is actually south for some of these species. This is their winter getaway. Uh, so the snowy owl will often come down from the Arctic and spend its winters here, as will the northern shrike and the bohemian waxwings. The great gray owls are a very familiar visitor on the right-hand side of the slide. You'll see a great gray owl there. And uh, other birds migrate through our area, such as the snow geese at the bottom of the slide. Many northern shorebirds pass through Ottawa on migration during the spring and summer and fall. They're already on their way back sometimes in what we usually think of as midsummer, because the breeding season up north is, of course, very short. So in all, we've had over 350 species of birds recorded within 50 kilometers of the Peace Tower by the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club, who are very diligent in keeping records of the birds of our area. And I certainly thank them for their efforts. It's been very helpful to me. I would like to note that some of these winter visitors, the owls in particular, attract a lot of attention when they show up. And one issue that we tend to see when these owls start showing up in the winter is a lot of people will go out and start trying to get photographs of them. Yes, I also have photographs of owls, but these photographs were taken from a respectful distance with a lot of zoom and without any baiting. Um, it's really unfortunate when people do start trying to bait the owls to get better and better photos. It's not fair to the birds. It's not fair to the sometimes live mice that people throw out there into the snow. Uh, and it, it's frankly, you know, encouraging poor behavior on the part of owls. We really don't want them to get used to being fed by people. Um, so please, if you do see an owl, uh, and a bunch of people crowding around trying to get photos of it don't add to the stress on the bird um, and, and try not to uh, participate in that sort of behavior. Appreciate wildlife from a safe distance for you and the wildlife is always the best rule. Back to the numbers again. Here we have over 80 species of fish. Now, our river systems and wetlands support lots and lots of different species. Most of them are quite small, like the central mud minnow at the top middle of this slide, or the northern red-bellied dace that you see pictured uh, in my hand there on the right, or the very small, but uh, will get bigger, at the bottom right of the slide, that's a young of the year, so a, a newly um, hatched smallmouth bass. So obviously some of our species do get to grow up and be quite sizable game species, like the bass, we have pumpkin seeds, we even have muskie living, muskellunge living in the Rideau River and the canal right downtown. It's phenomenal what you can see, even in the most urban parts of the city, if you just stop and look once in a while. Um, the bullhead catfish in the upper right we're seeing at Mud Lake, they're currently harassing a Canada goose in that photo. It was quite amusing to watch. And uh, the long-nosed gar in the bottom left of the slide is you know, something that you can see if you go up to Morris Island Conservation Area up in the far northwest corner of the city. It's a stunning species, quite large, and um, really a, a prehistoric looking fish. Very cool species. So, you know, anywhere you go in the city, you're not going to be very far away from water. We have some, you know, quite substantial river systems that flow through our city. We have a lot of wetlands, and so we have a lot of fish habitat. And it's really neat to go out and see some of these fish. And then, of course, there's the mammals. We're only one species of mammal living here in the city. There are over 50 species of wild mammals. 
And again, that part, that's apart from all of the livestock and domestic mammals and things that we bring with us. So we've got you know, a wide assortment of little furry neighbors that live among us, sometimes without people even knowing they're there. Um, you know, quite often people are surprised to realize that things like coyotes may be living in the woods down the street from their house. But uh, we've had Dr. Stan Garrett from the University of Chicago come in a couple of times to the city's wildlife speaker series to talk about just how incredibly adaptable coyotes are to urban living. And, you know, they, they can get along quite well, usually without people even knowing they're there unless they start to get accustomed to people giving them food or leaving food out that they can get to easily, that's when the trouble starts. So again, we remind people that while these mammals that we live with in our neighborhoods can be very cute, um, it's really best not to try to feed them or approach them too closely, they're not pets. And it's really important to, again, appreciate them from a safe distance and not let them get too accustomed to people to the point where they start aggressively approaching people in search of food. That's when we really do start seeing problems in human wildlife conflict coming out. So, I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it's okay to have, you know, some bird feeders and things around your yard. Uh, but do be careful about how much food you put out at any one time, because sometimes that can attract other species that you don't intend to feed. Um, even in some cases, bears. So I don't think many of us would appreciate having a bear show up in the backyard. Um, it would certainly be an exciting day, uh, as it was for some folks in Barhaven recently, just up the uh, street from my area here where the, uh, the bear did come across the green belt and, and was eventually trapped and relocated safely out of the city. Um, a wide variety of mammals, some, more, some of which you are more likely to see in the urban area, some of which are kind of surprising to some folks. So moving on. I know not everyone agrees with me, but these are some of my personal favorites. Um, the reptiles and amphibians have always been a personal interest of mine. It's important for people to know that none of our local species of snakes are dangerous. There are no venomous snakes in our part of Ontario. There's only one really you know, venomous snake um, in Ontario. Um, that could be dangerous. And even then, you know, the, the Massasauga rattlesnake is a very small and, and reasonably harmless rattlesnake. And it doesn't live anywhere near our part of Ontario. It lives over near the Bruce Peninsula only, and is in fact a species at risk at this point. Most of our turtles are also species at risk, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, and has a lot to do with the amount of roads that we have built in and near wetland areas. And this is a busy time of year for turtles. People may have noticed um, snapping turtles, particularly coming out to lay their eggs along road shoulders or in sandboxes or you know, playground areas near the river. Uh, it certainly has kept me and my colleagues at the city busy over the past week or so, trying to deal with snapping turtles that are picking bad spots to lay their eggs in. Um, so it's been interesting for us, but, uh, you know, the, these creatures are important to our local ecosystems, even though I know not everyone does find them attractive, but they really are a important part of our biodiversity in Ottawa. And, um, you know, most people, if, if they get a chance to get to know them, do develop at least a, a certain appreciation for them. Uh, and, you know, places like Little Ray's Reptile Zoo has been uh, instrumental in changing some people's attitudes towards some of these little creepy crawlies, as people call them. And then there are these thousands of other species, some of which we don't even have lists for. Um, just an amazing number of different things in, you know, fungi, lichens, insects, spiders, 
mollusks, you know, the snails and mussels at the bottom of the slide there, just outstanding diversity. And I know I said we don't have complete lists of all these things yet, but through some of the, you know, powers of technology these days, we're working to change that. And it's a bit of a crowdsourcing project that people can certainly help us with if they're so inclined. We mentioned iNaturalist earlier, and this is basically an online field guide and data repository for diversity information. Um, you can get it as an app on your smartphone, or you can use it on, a, on the computer through, the, you know, through a web browser. You can access and contribute to local biodiversity data using your, your smartphone or a camera and uploading photos of what you see. Data are constantly being added. I updated these numbers earlier today, and they had changed from about a week ago when I had last looked at them. So as you can see on the left side of the, the screen, there's just an enormous variety of insects. Over 3,000 species of insects have been reported to this system. Over 7,000 species overall in the city of Ottawa. It's amazing the diversity that people are able to observe when they're out and about in our city. And so you see most of the numbers line up fairly well with the official city lists that I was uh, pulling my numbers from earlier, but I may have to do some updating as I naturalist gathers more and more information. You do have to take the information with a, a little bit of caution. Um, there is an, a built-in verification system in the app. Um, you know, when people post photos, there, there are experts online who do go through and, and look at those photos and, and confirm or refute the identification. So if you don't know what it is, the app will actually suggest what it thinks your photo is of based on what it looks like and the location. So, you know, that usually it's fairly good with the more commonly reported species. Sometimes, though, it does need some help from the experts. And again, that's where you can just submit the photo without a solid identification and wait for the experts to chime in and help you out with it. And uh, just unbelievable source of information that my colleagues and I at the city will be able to draw from in terms of what species we have and where these species occur and of course, the, the issue with species at risk is that sometimes you don't want people to be able to know exactly where a species is found. And again, the app takes that into consideration and will automatically obscure the locations of sensitive species so that the poachers um, who may be interested in finding them uh, don't have exact coordinates by just looking at the app. Um, that is an issue with some of our turtle species, particularly, and with some endangered plant species, where you don't actually want people to know exactly where something is because it might disappear if the wrong people see the location. So there are some interesting observations here that I was able to um, look at when I was going through. Um, You'll note at the bottom of that list that it's got 34 species of amphibians and reptiles, including two introduced species. One of those is no surprise. It's the slider. And you know, we, we have a lot of red ear slider, and there, there may be some other slider species of turtles as well um, that have been introduced. Those are usually people's pets that they have gotten tired of or have, you know, they've outgrown people's ability to care for them. And so people let them go. And unfortunately, they have proven to be able to survive in our environment and they are uh, successfully invading many of our natural habitats. And so hopefully they won't cause too much competition for the native turtles, which are already under some stress. Um, it's another good reminder, folks, if you take a pet, you know, an exotic pet or, or any kind of pet, don't just release it into the wild if you can no longer care for it. Please do find a rescue 
for it or um, surrender it to the Humane Society if you can't care for that pet. It's not fair to anyone to release it out into the wild. The other introduced species in iNaturalist is um, the brown anal, which is a small lizard that's native to the Caribbean. Um, these three sightings in Ottawa were all related to lizards that came out of uh, probably potted plants that were imported from you know, areas in Florida where the lizard has become established. And sometimes they lay eggs in the nurseries of these tropical plant uh, sources and then Home Depot or other chain stores will import you know, the, the large quantities of tropical plants and sell them to people as house plants. And then surprise, uh, you may get a, a little bonus lizard with your plant. Uh, so I personally would not be um, too upset about that. That would be kind of fun for me, but I can understand that some other people might not find that quite so amusing to suddenly have a small lizard pop out of their palm at home. So it's very unlikely that the, uh, the brown anal will become an established species in Ottawa because they certainly would not be able to withstand our winters. Um, but other than that, it's, it's just an interesting thing to note. And uh, we'll keep an eye on the, the data in iNaturalist to see what else pops up over the years. Some of the threats to biodiversity that uh, people do often ask about, um, there are some of them I've already mentioned. Uh, one of the biggest ones though is habitat loss and fragmentation. And fragmentation of habitat can happen when we build roads, as I mentioned before. If you build a road through a wetland or between two areas of natural habitat, then you create a you know, a barrier essentially for many species between those patches of habitat. And it does lead to increased mortality in many cases. Um, certainly, you know, the city is very aware of the impacts of habitat loss and fragmentation. Major impacts have of course already occurred in the history of developing our city. Um, we have a quite large urban and suburban area and we know that obviously a lot of natural habitat was lost over the hundreds of years since the settlement of the area began. So there's not much that can be done for, you know, turning back the clock that way, but the city policies are in place and being developed through the new official plan to preserve the green spaces that we have and to improve our urban forest and to restrict the amount of further urban expansion and growth. And so those are important policies for protecting biodiversity into the future. We need to make sure that we have healthy natural areas, that those natural areas are connected so that wildlife and plant species can continue to exist and move across the landscape as they need to for their life cycles. We also need to make sure that that connectivity helps us to prepare for the impacts of climate change. We're already seeing some of those impacts. My colleagues in our resiliency group are projecting some of the uh, things we can expect in the years to come. And having those connected natural areas will be very important as you know, things shift and wildlife may need to move between areas of habitat even more to try to adjust and adapt to the changing climate and weather conditions that we're going to be facing. There's been recent research at the University of Ottawa to in fact, a link between climate change and the decreases that we've seen in native bumblebee populations. So there's some direct impacts there. Uh, due to the temperature changes going on, the rising temperatures. There's also changes that may occur with invasive species that may make their way into Ottawa um, and their spread may be facilitated through climate change. Certainly we've already seen immense impacts from some of these non-native invasive species that have already made their way here. The emerald ash borer is the tiny green beetle on the left side of the slide. The city's 
forest canopy was about 25% ash tree. Uh, ash is a very common species across Ontario. There are, in fact, several different species of ash. Um, you know, some of the more common ones locally were the white ash and the red and green. We also have some smaller numbers of black ash. And unfortunately, all of them are susceptible to the emerald ash borer. And most people are aware we've seen lots of trees across the urban part of the city having to be cut down in streets and parks and replaced as the borers advanced across the city and, and the ash trees died. Um, it's the same out in the rural area. Large proportions of our natural forests have been hit hard by the emerald ash borer. And so we're going to have to, um, you know, work with rural landowners as well to try to make sure that the forest health can be recovered um, and try to maintain some level of diversity of the tree cover across the city. We have, of course, other threats coming against our trees. This is going to be a big year for the gypsy moth. In many areas, there will be some significant defoliation as the caterpillars are currently up there in the canopy munching away on the leaves. In the next few weeks, we'll start seeing them pupating. And then there'll be a lot of little brown moths flying around. Those are the males looking for the large white females that you see in the middle lower part of the slide. The females cannot fly. So they just basically come out of their pupae and stay pretty close to where they emerge on the trunk of the tree usually. And they wait for the males to find them and then they start laying their eggs, which is that fuzzy tan mass that you see at the bottom of the photo. If you see these egg masses, you can certainly scrape them off the tree if you can reach them. Um, you know, that, that does help in, in cases where there's still only a limited number of moths. You can help control their numbers quite effectively that way. Uh, unfortunately, we, we do know that there are quite a few moths out there already, and it would be impossible to remove all of the egg masses. Um, several of our forests are, are quite infested. So um, this, is, this is another species that we're gonna have to learn how to deal with and manage our forests to try to ensure that they survive this additional stress. The, the effects of the gypsy moth in and of themselves don't usually wind up killing a tree, but when you add you know, the loss of its leaves and, and photosynthetic ability to you know, other stresses such as drought or you know, other urban environment issues like a lack of sufficient soil volume, these, these stresses can combine to have a, a severe cumulative effect on a tree. So this is just another thing that our forests really would, would we would rather they didn't have to deal with, but it looks like uh, it is already here, unfortunately. And uh, there are certainly other pests out there that our forestry services staff are keeping an anxious eye on to uh, try to make sure that they don't get established here either. The plant that you see with the white flowers is, um, already another already established invader in our forests, that's garlic mustard. And it and things like dog strangling vine and buckthorn are unfortunately well-established plant invaders in the understory of our forests. And these plants tend to crowd out the native species if they're allowed to get established. So that, that's another threat to our native biodiversity is that you wind up with forests with huge patches of garlic mustard in the understory and very little else. And so obviously that's not a good news story for many of our favorite spring wildflowers and other plants that you normally would expect to find in a native forest. So unfortunately, these, these non-native invasives, whether they're intentionally introduced, um, you know, like some of them were, the purple loosestrife was brought in because it was a very pretty flower. People wanted to have it in their gardens and then it escaped. 
or whether they're accidental introductions like the borer and the gypsy moth, um, they can have devastating impacts. And it's a lot easier to prevent them from getting loose than it is to try to eliminate them once they become established. It takes a lot of hard work to eradicate a species once it's in our environment. Some of the other things that um, people sometimes, you know, there, there are pretty controversial stances and arguments over are things like cats. Um, outdoor cats are a huge threat to the biodiversity of birds and small mammals, particularly, and honeybees. Uh, a lot of people are aware that you know bees are declining and they want to help save the bees. Um, unfortunately, some folks do go out and, and try to do that by getting a beehive in their yard. Uh, if they think that they're you know, helping pollination by bringing in lots of really effective pollinators, but honeybees themselves are not native to North America and bringing in lots of domestic honeybees. Uh, well, I've, I've heard researchers compare that to trying to save the birds by, you know, having chickens everywhere or trying to save the fish by putting, pouring a bunch of goldfish into Lake Ontario. Um, it, it's pretty much the same thing. Honeybees are livestock. Uh, and their primary role is to produce honey for people. There are agricultural uses for honeybees in some circumstances. And so certainly they do provide valuable service in the right circumstances, but native pollinators, native species of bees, and we have hundreds of native species of bees. Um, they can also do the job very well and in fact, bumblebees do a much better job of pollinating things like strawberries and tomatoes. So if you want to help save the bees, first of all, we have to work on controlling climate change. And then we also need to work on making sure that they have access to lots of good native flower sources that they've evolved to feed from and also access to habitat where they can breed and, and carry on their life processes safely. So restricting the use of insecticides in our yards has been a good thing for pollinators. And the current interest in providing more pollinator friendly native plant gardens in public spaces and in people's yards is also helpful. Um, but certainly there, there are some, some folks that really do want to help and there are ways that you can. And so we'll just, so to finish off on that note, um, how can you support Ottawa's biodiversity? Well, you can start by being a good neighbor to our local natural areas and our wildlife. Uh, we certainly urge you to get out there and enjoy Ottawa's many natural areas. I know a lot of people have been doing that over the course of the past year and a bit. Um, I have been myself. It's, it's very natural and healthy of us to want to do that. In fact, access to nature is one of the important themes that the city is trying to promote in our new official plan, which is currently under development. We want to make sure that everyone in the city, especially in the urban area, has the opportunity to access nature and green spaces because of the considerable physical and mental health benefits that being in nature provides. We also want people to appreciate and enjoy these areas, value them, so that we can continue to support their protection. And we do want people to recognize that they need to be respectful visitors to those areas, though, when they go out. Um, please stay on the trails where there are trails. Don't litter, take out everything that you bring in. And while you're in there, don't move around the rocks and logs and other habitat features. Remember that you're in someone else's home. And you know you wouldn't normally go to someone's house and start rearranging their furniture. It's the same when you go out to your local woods. Um, we do see a lot of people going out to natural areas and, and stacking rocks and making you know different rock sculptures and things. 
every time you, you do that, you remove a piece of habitat that a small creature might be living under and you remove opportunities for those small creatures to hide and, and you change the microclimate under that rock that existed. So please, we ask you to, to not do that when you go out. Uh, we don't mind kids going out and making, you know, stick forts and stuff occasionally, but try not to uh, leave everything disarranged, you know, when you, when you go out on a walk on the trails. When you're at home, if you have a garden or even a planter box on your balcony, see if you can plant some native species. You might be surprised by how many pollinators show up. Um, we were surprised this year here at my house, we've got fireflies in our yard for the first time. And I take that as a sign that we're succeeding in our efforts to include more native habitat, even in our own suburban backyard. Um, you also want to, you know, be a little more relaxed in your landscaping. Uh, don't tidy up all of the dried dead leaves and plant material from the year before. Don't worry about keeping your grass mowed as if it was a golf course. Um, less manicured spaces support more wildlife and especially pollinators. So if you've got some, you know, dead plant stems from last year, leave them for a while. Uh, if, you, if you clean up too early in the spring, a lot of the leaf litter and dead plant materials that you take out of your garden have overwintering bees and other pollinating insects nesting in them. And so if you throw all of that into, into your compost and send it out with the green bin in you know, April or early May, then you've just removed a whole bunch of pollinators from your yard. They might otherwise have stayed and, and provided service for your vegetable garden, if you have one. Um, Ted may have talked about this in his bird talk last week, but uh, bird safe window treatments are another way that you can definitely help with biodiversity in our urban and suburban neighborhoods and out in the rural area too. Anytime you've got a great big plate glass window, um, you know, looking out onto your beautiful garden, there's a chance that that window may pose a threat to birds. And so there are some very easily obtained um, types of window treatment that you can do yourself or you can hire a contractor to put onto your windows for you. Um, the most commonly seen is the grid pattern of, of small dots about the size of a pencil eraser. And you know that sort of treatment can really help to reduce the numbers of birds that would otherwise hit that window. And again, responsible pet ownership is, is a big one that people can do. Never release those you know, unwanted pets into the wild. Um, don't take wild animals into your house as pets in the first place. Um, you know, because sometimes people do that and, and they keep a wild animal for a while, like a frog or a snake or something, and, and then they release it again later. And, you know, if you don't release it in the right place or if it's contracted an illness while it was, you know, in your care, if you also have other non-native reptiles and amphibians, then that can lead to problems in, in the natural environment. So again, responsible pet ownership also includes controlling your dogs and cats outside. Um, if you're taking your dog out you know, on the trails in natural areas, please keep them under control. Uh, we've had you know, numerous cases where wildlife conflicts do come up because a dog was let run loose through a natural area at the wrong time of year. And the local wildlife, you know, this, this time of year, a lot of our wild mammals are raising their young. So same with a lot of birds. And uh, it can be very disruptive to them to have dogs crashing around through the underbrush uh, where they're trying to raise their families. So please do keep your dog close in the natural areas. And, um, you know, always be careful with your, uh, with your dogs and cats outside. And for some really positive efforts, you can get involved in local habitat restoration and community science projects like iNaturalist, as I mentioned earlier. 
Uh, if your local community association has an environmental committee, quite a few of our local community associations do, and, and many of them have programs to either remove invasive species from you know, neighborhood properties or have pollinator garden projects underway. And you can also find programs like that associated with the City Stream Watch program, although that's on hiatus this year again, unfortunately, but uh, when things get back to normal, that's another option. Um, and the, you know, things like the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club, which operates the Fletcher Wildlife Garden, is another opportunity to get involved in habitat restoration. And uh, they're also a great source of advice for how to naturalize your property. And, and they're even a great source of native plants if you can uh, manage to get in touch with them. Um, again, in normal times, they have an annual native plant sale in June of each year. And uh, they can also help you find other sources of native plants if you're interested in doing that in your yard. So there's lots of things that people can do to support Ottawa's biodiversity and keep it in a good, healthy state. Um, you know, obviously we, we do have a lot of introduced species here already. Not all of them are bad. Um, some of them have, have naturalized and found a place in the ecosystem. And so we, we do have quite a, a thriving variety of species here. Um, I believe you're going to be hearing about some of our species at risk in another talk later this week. Um, that, that's another interest of mine. That's kind of the, the flip side of biodiversity is, you know, there are several things that are in decline and hopefully, uh, you know, you'll, you'll tune into that and find out what those species are and, and what you can do to help support them too. But basically, if you support biodiversity in the first place, you will also be helping those species at risk um, because many of them are facing the same threats that we've talked about tonight in terms of you know, loss of habitat, fragmentation of habitat, mortality on roads for many of the turtles particularly. And so again, if we work to reverse and, and negate those threats to biodiversity in general, we can help the species that are most at risk as well. And also help ourselves because our city and our quality of life here depends in, great, in a great deal on having a healthy natural environment supporting us. And biodiversity is such a critical part of that having you know, a, a thriving, healthy ecosystem that can be adaptive and resilient in the face of change. And so you know, hopefully everyone here will recognize the importance of it and you know, try to do their part in appreciating it, celebrating it, and supporting it. Thank you. That's great, Amy. And uh, I you can stop here and ask if there's questions. Perfect. Perfect. So we do have a few, and, and you definitely touched upon most of the questions, but I think you can kind mm -hmm. of go into more detail. But one that you yeah. had just touched about, uh, touched on was a friend of mine has a pet raccoon. Is it a bad oh. idea to keep a wild animal as a pet? Is it illegal? It is actually illegal to keep a wild raccoon, yes. Um, it, it's it, it, certainly it's covered under the animal care and control bylaw. It's also covered under provincial law. Um, raccoons are a rabies vector species. So yeah, that, that's not generally considered to be a good idea unless the person has appropriate licensing to keep that animal. Um, there are facilities that do have permits to keep raccoons and other creatures for educational purposes or because they have been tamed to the point that they cannot be successfully released. Um, a lot of times people take in animals when they're very young, they find a baby that seems to be abandoned and they think they're rescuing it by taking it in and raising it um, in their house. It's illegal to do that for most of our native species unless you are a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. 
and we do have excellent wildlife rehabilitator here in Ottawa. Um, Rideau Valley Wildlife Sanctuary is certainly one of them that springs to mind. Uh, there is a list of licensed wildlife rehabilitators available on the provincial website um, from the, the Ministry of Natural Resources is responsible for the licensing of those facilities. So if someone does find a baby animal and they think it needs rescuing, it's best to contact a rehabilitator first before you take the animal in. In most cases, it may just be, you know, waiting for the mother to come back from her normal foraging activities. Um, and certainly I would not recommend keeping um, animals such as a raccoon as a pet. I know they're very cute <laughs> and, and people do like them. Uh, and, and, you know, but they can be quite um, risky as pets and, and there are laws against it. Okay, good to know. Okay, so we had another question that said, um, I often see people hand feeding chipmunks on the trails. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> then I noticed lately that the chipmunks at the beginning of NCC trails were acting strange and they weren't really um, moving out of the way as you approached and kind of mm -hmm. dashing around people's feet. Um, and they're yeah. making it worry, they're worried that they may be stepped on or hurt. Is this uh -huh. um, uh, some type of seasonal behavior or a result of being had fed? And is there something with, that we can do to help? Well, I, that's, that's a case of habituation. Uh, that's what we call it when wildlife becomes used to being hand fed. Uh, with chipmunks, it can be cute. With larger animals, not so much. <laughs> um, the, the behavior that the, uh, that the resident's describing of, of not getting out of the way, in fact, approaching people mm -hmm. um, and, and getting in and around their feet does put, as they know, it does put the animal at risk of being accidentally stepped on or hurt. It also puts you know, people at risk if, if a larger species is to start behaving in that way. And I have seen this myself in the green belt, at many of the trail areas, there, there are feeding stations that have developed over time. And I have, I have seen white-tailed deer walking right up to people. And I, that's, that's really unfortunate to see. I know people love the feeling of interacting with nature that directly, but it really isn't a good idea in the long run for the wildlife. Um, it, it's something that most wildlife specialists will advise against because it does put the animal at risk. Um, and, and for things like deer and raccoons and, and other animals like that that are capable of doing damage to people, if they get startled or if they're you know, in a bad mood, and people get too close, um, you know, they, they can hurt someone. And then, you know, the, the right. conservation officers get involved and usually it ends badly for the animal. So we really want to encourage people to not hand feed creatures, especially not ones that have the potential to hurt someone. Again, tossing a few sunflower seeds to a chipmunk or a chickadee along the trails is not a bad thing. And, and you know, it's, it's something that I've done myself with my children. It's a great introduction to nature and, and it's a really special feeling. But you have to balance that out with the animal's well being and not, you know, let it go to the point where they're putting themselves in danger to try to get the food from people. And ultimately, and they may be they'll be sort of more on on uh, on the humans to get their food, right? Like they get so- Yeah, yeah, you know, we, I'm sure many of us have seen what happens when Canada geese get used to being fed. Right. They get very aggressive. Um, and a lot of the times the food that people feed these wild animals is not appropriate food either. Right. Uh, and it can be quite bad for them. I mean, if you feed bread to ducks and other waterfowl too much, it can, it can give them terrible nutritional deficiencies and, in, and can in extreme cases result in them get, being crippled. So, wow. you know, it, it's a question of, you know, keeping it in moderation 
in terms of what you're feeding, what type of food you're feeding them, and, and just you know, limiting your contact. Like it's much better to just toss the food to the animal in many cases instead of trying to get actually get them on your hand. Uh, right. I, I will make an exception for things like chickadees and other small birds. <laughs> I mean, if you want to try to feed them from your hand along the trails, fine. Um, enjoy that. <laughs> but, uh, and, and but, but don't don't do it with you know Canada geese and and swans. And you're asking for at that point, right? <laughs> so that actually leads into another question. So you had mentioned the the bear uh, coming in in, in yes. the backyard, actually in Barhaven. So for situations like that, coming for bears coming into urban areas, what really lured them in? Was it, it would you uh, would avoid feeding um, other wildlife prevent the bear from coming into Barhaven? Well, um, that was then, an interesting case. Okay. The bear. I mean, there were there were successive sightings of a black bear starting over the weekend in Stittsville, southern end of Stittsville, then in South Canada, and then Barhaven. So personally, I think it was the same animal. I think it was moving through the green belt. Um, so it was, you know, wandering through the area. It may have been, you know, and I am speculating here, I didn't get to talk to the conservation officers who were involved in its relocation. But it's not uncommon for young animals to strike out on their own about this time of year and start looking for their own home. So, or, you know, there may have been other reasons for it to decide that it wanted to find somewhere else to go for a while. And the Green Belt does provide a great connected corridor around the urban part of the city. Unfortunately, if they if if animals moving through the green belt take a wrong turn at any point in that journey, they wind up in the suburbs. And right. things things can get tense very quickly when you've got a moose or a bear in someone's backyard. Uh, out in the east end, they've had several cases where they've had moose showing up in people's yards and even in their swimming pools. Wow. So, you know, it's obviously, um, it's kind of fun when you see it on the news. It's not necessarily so much fun when you see it in your personal yard um, or in your neighborhood. And then you're worried about, you know, what happens with your, with your kids and, and, you know, pets and everything. Um, so obviously, if you know that you're in an area where bears are common and, there are bears in the west end of the city, in the rural area particularly. Um, so I would certainly advise in the, um, you know, later in the summer and in the fall, those bears are going to be trying to fatten themselves up for winter mm -hmm. and they will be looking for every source of food that they can. So that's when our rural residents know that they especially need to keep their, you know, compost and their garbage and their livestock feed and their livestock very closely secured because the bears will come looking and in some cases they do even go after bird feeders um you know so so if you've got a bird you know a bird feeding station set up in your yard and you start hearing about bear sightings in the neighborhood i would recommend taking that feeder down until the the situation is settled i mean in the case of the bear in barhaven i don't think that was a factor because that bear was not simply looking for food it was on the move it was looking for a new place to live and it took a wrong turn when it got to woodruff and it wound up in a in a residential suburban neighborhood um, however in the end it worked out because the bear has now been relocated to white lake outside the city and uh, so it'll have much more opportunity to seek out a, a nice home for itself in an area with lots of natural habitat where it hopefully won't run into suburban communities again. <laughs> and in the case so, when that happens, um, mm -hmm. so we've, we've, I know we even friends have had sightings of coyotes, so coyotes, yep. bear, deer. It, do you initially, should you be calling someone initially when you, when you spot them? Do we call 311 or an animal patrol of some kind, or do we just sort of let it watch and from the safety of our yeah. homes <laughs> what's what if, i mean recommend? if there's no if there's no immediate threat 
um, then it's not necessarily something you need to call about. For a bear in a suburban area, unfortunately, that, that's, that's kind of a different situation where, where you, you do probably want to call that in um, because there's just too many things that can go wrong in, those, in that situation. For something that's common in suburban neighborhoods like coyotes, I mean, I know not a lot of people realize this, but coyotes are actually common in suburban neighborhoods. Uh, pretty much any natural area will be home or potential home to coyotes. Most of the time, you will not even realize they're there. And this is something that we've covered in our wildlife speaker series. And in fact, we've got a recorded session um, up on the city's YouTube channel about urban coyotes. And it's absolutely fascinating research being done around the city of Chicago uh, by Dr. Garrett. And so I encourage anyone who's got, you know, interest in coyotes or questions about coyotes to go ahead and watch that um, recording on YouTube. And it, it's phenomenal how well they can get along with suburban neighbors as long as they don't get used to finding food from people. As long as they stick to hunting the rats and rabbits and squirrels and the normal prey, everything's fine. But it, it's when people do start feeding them or accidentally feeding them by leaving edible stuff out where they can get it and start they start getting habituated to people that that's where we get the problems that and seems to be our theme yeah that's where we okay. think the problem was with the coyote episode in riverside south last year right okay yeah. good to know so that's good again, to know do not approach <laughs> okay so we've got one quick question before we sure. end it tonight and it was about um what are what are good flower sources to help save the bees and which native plants do you suggest or is that a good well, way there to are there are so many different ones that you could choose from um we have some resources for people who are interested in that on the pollinators page of the city's website so you know like obviously milkweed is one of the big ones that um you know all sorts of species will go for uh, there's a picture of swamp milkweed, one of the different species of milkweed on this slide. It's the, uh, the one on the left there, the pink flowers. Um, the, we have a pollinator garden at City Hall that we established a few years ago now um, with the help of folks from the Fletcher Wildlife Garden and the Wild Pollinator Partners. Um, we got the plants there from the Fletcher Wildlife Garden and from Ferguson Forest Center, which also has perennial plants, native perennials that people can buy. So things like um, coneflowers, brown-eyed Susans are very popular. Um, there's a, a wide variety. Uh, to some degree, it does depend on the conditions in your yard in terms of how much sunlight you get and all that sort of thing, just like any other garden plant. So I encourage people to, you know, seek out those, those resources on the pollinators webpage or from the, the Fletcher Wildlife Garden and, um, you know, ask some of the experts there for, for advice too, because there's, there's so many to choose from. Uh, we do have a little bit of a short list of native plants that, you know, we recommend people try instead of some of the, uh, the usual suspects of ornamental non-natives. Uh, on the city's web page as well, but th there's big lists that uh, you know certainly can be referred to. Perfect. And with that, we'll end uh, there. Amy, thank you very much for your presentation. The pictures were gorgeous and very informative. I think we all learned something tonight. Uh, thank you everyone for coming and for staying till the end. Uh, for more wildlife programs, tune on uh, Thursday, June 24th for the next program in the series, Ottawa Urban Wildlife, Cons Conserving uh, Species at Risk. And for more information about programs, check the Ottawa Public Library website at uh, biblioottawalibrary.ca. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Have a great night.